I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask our chaplain if you would open our meeting with prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this study here, Lord. We just thank you for all that you do for us. We ask you now, dear Lord, to just come and bless us. Bless everyone here today, dear Lord. No matter what their need or, or desire, we just ask you to touch our hearts and our lives. Use us to do your will. We ask you now, dear Lord, a special blessing on our account, especially our youth and our seniors, dear Lord. Touch them in a mighty way. Help us to be the ones that will go out and tell everybody about your love and your grace and your mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Freedom of Information Announcement in accordance with the South Carolina Code of Laws of 1976 is amended. The Mary Star Mothers Enterprise has been notified of the date, time, place, and agenda of this meeting. Item 4, approval of minutes dated February 22nd. So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. The ayes have it. Resolutions. I'm not aware of anything pending we have unless anybody has anything new. I have one in this session. Um, I make a motion that uh, council pass a resolution to support Marion County, South Carolina for the Clemente C. Kingsley Make Prime Act H-3014 request approval of the said act by the South Carolina Senate. So moved. Got a motion. Second. Got a second. Any, other, any discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. The yeah, ayes have it. Ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. This will be short and to the point. Uh, item A is still on hold. There was a little bit of activity not too long ago with the company um, and our economic development folks, so hopefully that will be moving forward shortly. Item B and C are both on hold. Those public hearings will be on March the 28th, so then we can do third reading after we do that. That's all I have. All right. Item seven, committee reports. Committee number one has no report at this time. And as far as I know, there's nothing before that committee. That's correct. Vice Chair Kenny. Nothing at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, legal update. I don't have anything in this section either. Mr. Jimmy Floyd, Director of Detention and Jail Inspection Report. I don't does that need to be an executive session? No, sir. Oh, we'll talk about some of it in executive yeah, session. Yeah, I think there's segments of it that do need to be because it's dealing with security at the jail, so some of it, but I, I think general premise, some of it can be discussed in open session, yes. It just answer the questions that they have. All right, Mr. Floyd, you're up. Because what we can in open session. Let me quickly pass out. Everybody did not have last time. Last time. <laughs> I got Chairman, distinguished members of the council, you have before you the South Carolina Department of Corrections Inspection Report, the State Fire Marshal's Report, and the most recent DA report for the detention center. The very first page, just to ensure that all the council members are up to speed. When I first came and took over the jail on behalf of the sheriff in 2019, uh, the South Carolina Department of Corrections report showed 47 deficiencies at the detention center. Our most recent inspection report, which is the copy you have, showed 12, and we should, we were just inspected again this past week because it is a biannual inspection, and we should be down to nine deficiencies. So you can see we have made great strides in reducing the number of deficiencies noted as a result of the 
state's minimum standards for local detention facilities. Also in that regards, the fire marshal report in one of 2019, we showed 31 state fire code deficiencies. As of current, there are only four remaining state fire marshal code deficiencies, and we hope to have those four corrected by our next inspection. The remaining South Carolina Department of Correction deficiencies will take new construction to address. The bottom of the, the summary sheet that I provided each of you is simply a short bullet point of some of the things that we have accomplished over the last... I don't have what you read. Um, <clears throat> that is not an all-inclusive list at the bottom, but that is a bullet point list of some of the things that we have done at the detention center over the past four years to address these deficiencies. Um, <clears throat> we can move into the actual report if the council so desires, or we can discuss those things as mentioned by Mr. McLean in executive session. That is up to the, Mr. Up to the council. Yes, sir. And again, the, the general topic of the report, I think is all public information. The, the solutions to some of that that involve security items would need to be discussed in executive session. So I, I would have to defer to Mr. Floyd as to which is which. He knows more about that than I do. Um, okay. Item one, and I think you'll notice from the report they accidentally duplicated uh, a couple of the items on the very first page, and again on the next page they duplicated the first page. But the the first deficiency, which should not be, does not affect security, is the number of personnel as as council is aware. The minimum standards for the state require an assessment of the facility for staffing to be completed each and every year. The Association of Counties completes that staffing assessment and it had not been done since the jail had been built uh, until 2020. In 2020, when we had the first staffing assessment done the staffing assessment showed that we are currently to operate the facility properly 13 positions short. This will continue to be a deficiency until some plan is put in place to hire those 13 additional personnel that staffing assessment calls for. There's a question for you. Does the current budget allow for the 13? Current budget, no. Those would have to be added to future budget through the budget process. We have requested additional slots each and every year. However, they have not been approved. In the current budget, how many um, slots are not filled? In the current budget, we currently have six openings. We have six uh, new hires that will start on the 20th with the start of the new pay period that are currently going through all of the processing phases. Um, <clears throat> so we should become fully staffed so by need, the end of the month. You need 13 more on top of the new six. Correct. Based on the state staffing assessment. In in general, Mr. Rogers, we have seven posts that have to be manned 24-7 within the detention center. And if I am fully staffed and no one is on vacation or sick leave, I have seven people per shift. The majority of the additional personnel is what's required to cover those posts when someone is out on vacation, someone is out sick, or we happen to have a vacancy in addition to a, a couple of new slots. Sheriff Wallace uh, did manage to address two of the staffing concerns. Um, one of those was addressed under the previous county administrator. Uh, because the staffing standards require the detention center to have a full-time maintenance person. Um, the county transferred one of its maintenance slots to the detention center approximately two years ago. And a slot that the sheriff's office had, which was not really extra 
but in addition, in an effort to help appease some of the staffing issues at the detention center, Sheriff Wallace transferred one slot from the sheriff's office to the detention center. That leaves us at the current number of 13. Oh, wait, wait one second. So you have six new hires right now, correct? Mm -hmm. And then you have six additional openings after that? Or that that's, no, that's that covered under six openings. authorized slots. When, when those so people start working, is, when those people start working in the next pay period, you will be completely whole as far as what we budgeted. Yes. Okay, that's what I mean. The, thir the 13 slots from the staffing assessment would be on, on top of that council. So when you're fully staffed, you say you got one person per post. post correct. If you're fully staffed, we got two person per post? No. If I'm fully staffed, I will have one person per post with no personnel for leave coverage, vacation time, sick leave, or shortages. So we got one person to cover that. Was it C-Pod or whatever to open yes. space? Yes. One, one person, person to cover C-Pod, one person to cover A-Pod, one person to cover B-Pod. One person to run central control, two personnel are assigned to, to booking, typically a male and a female, and then we have the shift supervisor. Those are the seven identified posts from the staffing assessment. <clears throat> classification plan. A uh, classification plan is the requirement from the state to assess an inmate based on their charges, their disciplinary record within the detention for center and house them accordingly. Currently, the detention center only has three housing units, one of which is a female housing unit. And that is what causes this deficiency. We do not have the housing units nor the ability to separate and classify inmates according to the minimum standards. That is an item that will require new construction to address in the form of additional housing units and bed space. The classification review, which goes hand in hand, states that an inmate's classification should be reviewed every 30 days to determine whether they should remain in their current classification or because, for example, they have been an inmate that has not caused any problems, not gotten any trouble, whether their classification status could be lowered and they could be moved to a housing unit that allows more freedoms and privileges, or whether they have been an inmate that has had disciplinary issues and has received some form of disciplinary action that has increased their level of custody. And again, it fall, goes hand in hand with the classification plan. We do not have the housing units nor bed space to conduct the reviews and move personnel according to a classification from minimum, medium, maximum, or disciplinary housing. We simply do not have those housing capabilities. Uh, <clears throat> while they quote it, the next one, the initial planning is not really a deficiency. It is simply a reminder from them that the Department of Corrections must be involved from the onset of any planning for any expansion or renovations. We have done that with the renovations that have currently taken place. Those renovations were part of the original expansion plan from 2019 that was not approved. Uh, <clears throat> based on the deficiencies, uh, we were given approval to move forward with those renovations. And most of those are what is the summary of which is on the first page, the summary sheet. Um, <clears throat> Fire codes, um, a number of the things involved with the fire codes do involve the security of the facility. Council wishes to discuss that. I would probably ask that that is done in executive session. <clears throat> the control center, uh, the requirement is that the control center have access to a wash basin and a toilet within the control center. Um, when the facility was originally built, it was plumbed for that, but the decision was made not to build that. That was part of the renovation. We utilized the existing plumbing and constructed the wash basin and toilet within the control center. So that is no longer an issue. That was shown to the inspectors as completed on the most recent inspection. Uh, 
perimeter security, um, kind of nitpicking from the Department of Corrections, but there was some vegetation growth on the fence between it and the uh, impound lot that is there. We had the ground, our personnel and the personnel that the county has on contract to cut the grass. We had it sprayed and had that cleaned up. So that should be removed. Housing for the handicapped, this is one that is a big issue with the Department of Corrections because of the ADA requirements. Um, <clears throat> quite frankly, we simply do not meet that standard. If the council has been provided with a copy of the response to this report by the county administrator, you will see that we did have handicap cells designed in the original facility, but through construction oversight, architectural oversight, whatever the case may be, the doors that were put on the units that had the handicap access built into them were 32 inch doors. Handicap access requires a minimum clearing of a 36, 30 door, 36 inches. So we can, we do not have the handicap rating because those narrow doors were put on those housing units. And there is truthfully no way to correct that with the design of the jail. When we address future construction with additional housing and beds, this will be an issue that has to be addressed. It is a significant liability hanging over the head of the detention center and the county at this time. Can I go back to the control center? Um, so it does have a toilet. It does now. Now. That's what I saw. Yes. New, okay. Yes. It does now. It did not until it did not in September, October. Okay. It is part of the ongoing current renovations, which you saw most of yesterday. And it was just completed and made operational about three weeks ago. Okay. So yes, that is one that one of the ones that should come off from the next inspection report. Is there anything else that's needed in that control center outside of what is recommended by the minimal standards? <clears throat> At this point in time, I would have to say no, Councilman Rogers. Uh, as far as our control center now, we are in pretty good shape. Obviously. If we move forward with future construction, then there will be a need to add another computer for monitoring the cameras because, as you saw yesterday, the three big screens that have uh, the majority of the camera monitoring on them, that computer is pretty well full with what it can, can handle as far as displaying number of displays that can operate and number of cameras that can display on there. So if we move forward, Additional security features, which would include additional cameras, would require that. Other than that, we are in good shape as far as our central control room. And what about the status of electronic controls? When someone needs to open up a door in the control center, they're pressing a button or unlocking. It, is that electronic system? That is that is pretty much the standard uh, across the board for detention centers. Quite frankly, if we were designing new, I would I would recommend against having the entrance to the control center within the Sally Port leading to a housing unit. That is not a safe design. The entrance to it should be completely separate from any housing unit. But the, <clears throat> the card access that is in place for the detention center, the electronic locks that are in place, the requirement to press a call button and central control acknowledge you to open the doors if you do not have either a key because you're authorized a key or an access card because you have been authorized and issued an access card. That is the standard. Um, and we are constantly Im improving those things. As you can see with the new secure lobby, um, for the public to prevent the inmates exiting the facility. That is a requirement that is not mentioned in the report. 
but there is a requirement for a separate exit, which we have now done with the secured lobby and, and the exit hallway, and all of that will be on access control as well. Yeah, that I really was um, pleased with that, the new entrance to the facility. It was totally different, and it makes sense once you go through it and see how much more secure it is for everybody. I think the magistrate court as well. It is. It, previously, as everyone who, who's been to the building knows, if you walk through the front door, the, the lobby area was wide open for a potential active shooter or anything along those lines, which unfortunately, 10 years ago, we did not really have to worry about. But in today's society, in today's times, it is a very real threat. And a court system would be a high value target just as a school is. And yes, the steps we have taken there have, or at least as soon as the remaining electronic security items are completed, will secure the public from that potential threat. I have a question. I'm back to the one person, the API, CPI. How many inmates that you normally have in the API, CPI versus that one officer, and how many that you? Um, a pod and B pod are currently rated for 16 maximum security inmates per housing unit. Uh, because of the mental health crisis, we took two of those cells, which are separated from the rest by a wall and a door, and turned those into mental health slash medical observation cells. So we currently have 14 uh currently rated single occupancy cells for A and B housing. The big open bay housing unit is 64 beds. You got one, this said you got 45 people and you got one officer. One officer. How many uh, staff do you have now? How many officers do you have from you on down? If we were fully staffed or currently? If we were fully staffed. If we were fully staffed, including the civilian maintenance man and myself, we would be 35. How many of them admin? Command staff? The command staff. Uh, there's myself, my administrative lieutenant who handles all of the commissary and phone systems, video visitation systems, the training officer, my PREA coordinator who also doubles as the recruiting officer and, and the new hire manager for me that would be the command staff and then there is one additional lieutenant who is actually my lieutenant op of operations who is responsible for the jail itself so i have counting myself i have three command staff that would be considered administrative excuse me counting myself i would have four considered administrative and <clears throat> Each one of those positions is one that is required by the minimum standards. By law, we have to have a pre coordinator. Does not mean I cannot assign them additional duties, which I have, because we don't have enough pre complaints to justify just having a full time person in that slot. Training is a full time, especially with the turnover rate at detention centers. Uh, and then Everything that is on the actual administrative lieutenant is full time job. There are in in the thirteen, because I'm assuming making an assumption that that's kind of where, where you're leaning with this. In the thirteen additional personnel that the staffing assessment calls for, all of those are line officers, with the exception of they recommend a civilian clerk position to assist with all of the paperwork and reporting. So 12 of the 13 would be line officers and one would be a, a clerk position. So I put two people in your pod. <clears throat> it would it would not put two people in a pod, but what it would do would uh be to allow two personnel as transport officers. So the trip to the hospital, taking them to court. And all these other things are not making the shifts even shorter staff because right now when we have a transport, myself, some of the administrative staff have to do those. 
or we have to pull somebody off of shift. So my administrative staff ends up doing most of the transports, which prevents them from doing the job they're supposed to be doing. So it would include two transport officers, um, and it would include, include personnel for each shift so that when people go on, it would add rovers to the shift, which are additional personnel, which would assist in any pod as needed. And it would also add the additional personnel so that if I have somebody who's on vacation and then somebody calls out sick, instead of being too short on the shift now and only having five officers and forcing us to call people in on overtime, the rovers would be able to keep us at the minimum staffing of seven at all times. <clears throat> I have no question. Jimmy, you've been here, what, four years, you say? Four or five? Uh, five years and just a couple of days that I've been home from overseas. When I, I, I'm looking here in the rated capacity and shows that 96 is total capacity. That's correct. And your average is about 64. Is that in keeping with what you've seen? Or no, that's upper days? no, that is not in, in keeping with what I've seen. Um. The, what they show on the report here is simply the what the population was on the day they came in and did that inspection. Um, I will be the first to admit our numbers are no lower now than they were when I first got here. We are still somewhat at COVID numbers. Um, and honestly, I can guess of a number of reasons why that is. But if you look at J. Reuben Long in Horry County, Dillon County, Florence County, Darlington County, everybody else that, that I talk with and deal with on sometimes a daily basis from across the state. We are pretty much the only facility that has not returned to pre-COVID numbers as of yet, but our numbers are slowly creeping up. We're in October. We'd had a term of courting. We're down at 64. We're mid 80s now pushing up towards 90 again so we're starting to return in 2019 when i first got here we were over capacity a minimum of 40 percent of the time we and when i say over capacity i'm not talking one or two 40 percent of the time we had more than 105 inmates stuck into basically 96 beds and i think our high count for 2019 was somewhere around 124, 125 inmates, which is part of what pushes the need besides the, the fact that the Department of Corrections is, is pushing for the prison camp to be closed uh, because of the, its age and conditions and not meeting fire codes and safety codes and all. is That's part of the reason why we need to be looking at building the additional beds and house space and housing units, because not only do we need to bring the, the inmates in from the, or the trustees and sentenced inmates in from the prison camp, but we also need to build so when we go back to pre-COVID numbers and we're looking at 125, 130 pre-trial inmates. I have a question. Um, <laughs> currently, where, where, where do you say most of your inmates are from? Most of them, obviously, because that's where the majority of the of the population resides, but most of them come from Marion and Mullins addresses. And I would have to, off the top of my head, without actually running a report to look at, at actual addresses, I would have to say that the majority of them are probably right now coming from, <clears throat> from the city of Marion. As far as the, the residents. You know, many of those, even though they may stay in the city of Maine, they're committing crime and get arrested, getting being arrested for things that occurred out in the county. Uh, the, the next item, furnishings. Um, <clears throat> furnishings, this deals with it with a number of things. Uh, some of it deals with us being over capacity, even though our number is below total capacity. 
Um, some of it deals with us being over capacity in certain housing units. Uh, typically, we're under capacity in our, our female housing unit where the majority of, of the vacant beds are with the females and male capacity, we're over capacity. We're over capacity now on that. Um, and that's why they're, they're saying we don't have the required furnishings because we're over capacity in the male housing units. The day rooms, um, it's basically the, the same thing. We have to have adequate space to have the, the day rooms that we need for the inmates. And because we're over capacity currently in our male housing units, we're not meeting the minimum required standards for square footage for the inmates that are housed in those units and the required number of furnishings for the inmates in those housing units. Um, maintenance, um, and they mention it several places in here, not only with the maintenance part of it, but medical, uh, property storage, equipment, supplies, material being inadequate, uh, for the population that we serve, even at the, the 96. We do have the medical area has been, medical exam area has been completed now as part of the renovations. Um, Councilman Rogers visited yesterday and, and took a tour of the renovations that we have completed thus far. And we talked about that as well as the punch list of things that we're finishing up, which hopefully will completely be completely through with this phase of the project by one April. Um, but we, <clears throat> we're not going to be able to address the, the storage capacity of what we've currently got without the, the new construction. Um, we do have a, a concept, which we're hoping that out of the current bond funds, after we finish this, there will be enough funds remaining to move forward with a the concept that we've got to alleviate the laundry storage inmate property room issues. Um, just to brief the council on that, <clears throat> current jail construction is running about $500 a square foot or higher. Um, <clears throat> the original blueprints and plans that went out to bid and were rejected, built all of that additional storage and laundry room within the within the secure confines of the housing units and the secure perimeter of the new building. So it would have cost us roughly $500 a square foot to build that, um, in my opinion. And in the opinion of a number of, of experts I've talked with, there is no need to build that within the secure confines. We have state trustees that are the ones that operate the laundry and other things for us. We can cut that cost to roughly 175 to $200 a square foot by building the additional space for those items within a commercial metal building and then building the inside of it out and simply connecting it to the jail through a secured sally port. Significant savings to the county, $175 a square foot versus 500 or higher a square foot. So that is the concept that we're looking at now. We're simply waiting to finish everything that we're currently on to see whether the money remains to try and bring that forward and move forward with it with an actual design phase and plans to build commercial metal building to house those and alleviate all the rest of our remaining deficiencies with the exception of those tied to building housing units and bed space for inmates. <clears throat> the DHEC report will be the next one in your packet. We always do extremely well on the, the DHEC report. I think the only issue we've ever had with DHEC was when the ceiling tiles were out due to the leaking roof, all of that has been corrected. And as council can see, we achieved a 100% rating on from DHEC for the kitchen and kitchen services. The Councilman Gilchrist helped with those. Do what? The ceiling tiles. Uh, Ceiling tiles came from the the contractor and stuff that uh, 
has been doing the renovations for the and all. Um, and I think they came from the big. Uh, well, I know they did. I cannot think of the name of it, uh, but it's the big company out of Conway that supplies PD tile, and most of them we were able to because of being a government agency purchased directly from them at uh, savings to the county. Do you? I, I think you should tell them about that ongoing issue um, in the ladies' pod where it's some of the um, the water was still coming through because of the construction design. Uh, yes. Quite frankly, our, our current facility is poorly designed and poorly constructed. Um, as anyone who has dealt with building a home or anything knows, when, when you build a brick home, you put flashing at the, the bottom of the wall with weep holes in the brick. So any water that manages to get between the brick and the wooden framing of the house against the, the Tyvek water sealer fabric runs down, hits that flashing, and then it's turned to the outside of the building to keep it dry. Unfortunately, the problem that we have had with the leaks at the detention center has not only been the roof, as we found out, um, the walls and the sandstone type brick that was put around part of it, the mortar between the bricks and the sandstone has deteriorated. Some of it has fallen out, uh, allowing water to get between the concrete block wall and the fascia brick. And there is no flashing at the bottom of weep hole to bring that water out. So when we get a blowing rain from either side, that water finds those cracks, gets behind the brick and against the concrete block security walls, runs down the concrete block security walls and where the the two high walls are on either side of the, the building built on top of the 12 inch steel beams. Those beams are through the lobby and through the booking area and part of the, the female housing and the hallway within the jail. When the water gets in there, it runs down with no flashing and no weep hole to turn it back to the outside. It runs down on top of those steel beams and then runs off of the steel beams inside the building. Um, part of the renovation that we've done is we had a, a company come and look. They have resealed the the brick with caulking and sprayed it because that sandstone type brick will over time as it loses this its coating it will absorb water and water will absorb through the brick to the inside in extended periods of rain um that has been resealed and this has been an ongoing battle for the the entire five years i've been here because every time we have thought we had the leaks fixed and We've had several rains. Then we get a bad storm with a lot of wind and blowing rain, and it finds a finds a new spot to come in through those walls, and we end up with water inside the facility again. Uh, <clears throat> we had, as part of these renovations, um, we basically told the, the the contractor that's doing these renovations for us that we needed these water leaks fixed. They brought in an inspections team from one of the, the major roofing outlets that they use on the majority of their projects. And most of what I have imparted to you is, is knowledge that was gained from that inspection team coming in and doing a full assessment of the roof and the building and the structure itself. Um, <clears throat> and one wall, <clears throat> which they should be starting on this morning. They were there when I left to come here. The inspection report that they came up with, and I even took that inspection report and, and talked with other people more knowledgeable than I am in construction and asked them to look at it and tell me if, if it seemed correct. The answer that I got was yes. The only way that they came up with on the one side that it leaks the worst due to the deterioration of, of that wall was we'll seal the wall, which we've done, and then come back and lay commercial metal sheeting over the brick on that side and tie it to the edge under the roof cap and bring it all the way down the wall 
so that any water that hits that that metal sheeting simply runs down the metal sheeting and is turned out onto the roof to the drains. So that is being done today and hopefully will be completed by, by Friday. That is one of the, the final items on this group of renovations. <clears throat> um, to try and not keep taking up in, any more of your time because I know this has been quite long. Uh, the last report here is the state fire marshal's report. There were uh, 14 deficiencies that had been on the previous report that are noted on this one. As you can see, the first uh, nine were corrected when this report was, was done. We had one new major deficiency pop up, which is shown as, as number 10. Um, we're required by state fire code to have a biannual inspection of the and maintenance of the generator and emergency power system during the last, with a full inspection once a year, which includes load testing and a checking of the, the transfer switch. Uh, that inspection was done just a couple of weeks prior to the state fire marshal coming to conduct this inspection. And in that inspection, it was found that the contactors in the existing transfer switch had burnt um, due to some issues with the generator itself and the control system on the generator, creating a severe fire hazard. Uh, we had to make some immediate changes to address that and get it repaired. That has been repaired. And as of the most recent inspection, the inspectors were provided a copy of the building permit or not the building permit, but the electrical permit for the work. The local authority from the building department sign off from inspecting it and a updated report from Blanchard Cat, who has the contract to do the service and maintenance on the generator. So that has been corrected and repaired. We have also conducted the inspection that is required of all of the fire rated openings and walls at the facility. So that will be corrected as of the next one. And we are, as we speak, developing, now that we have the fire panel and everything else fixed, we are developing the training required by the state fire marshal and we'll have it in place along with the required quarterly drills by the next state fire marshal inspection. So un unless we have something else break regarding the, the state fire codes, we should have zero deficiencies on that report as of the next inspection. That takes us through through all of the reports. I'm open for any additional questions. Jim, question. I do have one question. Oh, you. We still have the contractor working, correct? At the facility now. You still have a contractor that's working on the renovations to change. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the report from the state, I guess the detention center board or whatever. Um, they say removal of urinals and toilets from unused areas. Yes. To be quite, to, done to, to, to be quite honest with you, uh, Councilman, that was nitpicking on their part. When they came in October, we were in the middle of getting the renovation started and going. And the urinals that were there were the old urinals that had been removed from the facility and they had all been stacked outside so that we could continue moving forward with the refurbishment of the restrooms and showers and replacing the furnishings with the new furnishings mm -hmm. to get us in compliance with the code. And we simply, instead of taking a day or two to load these things up and haul them off, we continued to move forward trying to get all the renovations done. And they said, oh, you need to clean that up. Gotcha. And we have cleaned it up since then because we finished all of the plumbing renovations. Um, Mr. Spencer, our maintenance uh, man, got one of the trailers from the 
roads and bridges crew brought it over and the, the trustees assigned to him after all of that was done it was all loaded up and cleaned up and, and moved thank you so quite frankly that was something that was simply nitpicking uh, because it plainly explained to him the only reason that stuff is, is there is because we're full tilt in the trying to get these renovations done. And as soon as we reach the point where we can, without it impeding the contractors, we'll move up. We'll remove all of this stuff because we self-performed as much of the renovations as we could. Uh, for example, we had to bring a company in to demo the, the broken tile and everything out of the showers and restrooms and refer those, but all of the plumbing we removed all of the plumbing ourselves, so we did not bear the expense of a plumber, and we reinstalled all of the plumbing ourselves so that we did not have to play, pay the cost of a commercial plumber to do it. And because he was trying to get the housing units back up and operational and the showers back up and operational, I told him, I made the decision, told him, do not worry about hauling those off until we get the housing units back up and the showers and the urinals and everything back up and operational. And they decided to cite us for that. Okay. Any other questions? Sure. One other. I know that for a couple of years, we had a lot of problems with that. The lighting has been corrected, and that is one of the items on the state fire marshal's report that shows as, as having been corrected. Um, that was something, yes, that was a very big issue. It was something that was causing us a lot of problems. Um, but it is corrected and fixed now, and it is no longer a deficiency on the fire marshal's report. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Thank you for your time. We appreciate what you do. All right, item 10, Don Strickland, PDRTA. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Council, staff, and citizens, everyone else involved. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to come and share today. Do want to give kind of a transit update, and we do have a presentation. Um, I'm Don Strickland, Executive Director at PDRTA, and I brought along with me Mr. Will Johnson. Um, Will is kind of our public outreach has been heavily involved in a, a lot of different initiatives doing a lot more than just public outreach for us and he's been pretty incredible since he came on board so I'm glad that he's here today to be able to share some of the presentation that he actually put together so I just want to be able to share that with you. Um, first off I just want to just kind of talk about where we've been um, this past January 2023 so about 13 months ago 14 months ago we started um, a lot more service in Marion County. We have the Marion Express, the Mullins Express. Uh, prior to that, we were doing, obviously, you may all know, but we run to Myrtle Beach 363 days a year, taking employees to work um, from mainly Mullins and and, uh, and Marion, but we do pick up along the way a few other areas. And uh, this time of year, it starts picking back up. It's starting to move into the um, what we call the peak season. Usually it's April through through Labor Day. And then it drops off and we end up having anywhere from 15 to 20 passengers going down every morning and then back every afternoon. So in the peak, we'll end up taking 30 to 40 to work every day and uh, the, around the coast and bring them bring them back to uh, Marion County. Um, so we're averaging right now about 3,500 trips a month right here in, in Marion County. Um, a couple of years ago, that number would have been somewhere between 12 and 1,500. Um, a lot of that has to do with the new services we began. I want to give a big thanks to Marion, Marion County Healthcare Foundation that allowed us to be able to really start these routes. They, they've helped us fund the, the Myrtle Beach services for several years, but um, most recently they gave us a grant for three years to help us kind of introduce a pilot program. To, and um, it's certainly turned into more than just a pilot program. The services are doing extremely well. And uh, so that's the Marion Express, Mullins Express on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We're all over Marion County doing demand response services. What that means is they're scheduling the day before. They, so today, if they were to schedule a trip, tomorrow we'd pick them up and take them to their destination. A lot of folks don't know that if you're a Medicaid recipient in the state of South Carolina and you're feeling sick today, you have to wait 72 hours to be able to book your trip to go to your appointment. 
And uh, so we're thankful to be able to pretty much provide next day service for those trips because I don't want to wait three days to go to the daughter's office. Um, so that's uh, Britain's Neck, Gresham, Centenary, Rain Cellars, uh, Nichols. We're going all over. It's not just Marion and Mullins to pick up these folks. A lot of the pastors that we're transporting now are seniors. We have a lot of seniors, a lot of disabled individuals. Um, they just don't have access. We have a lot of folks going to grocery stores, pharmacies, doctor's appointments. Um, a lot of these individuals, a lot of these citizens were paying $15, $20, $25 dollars each way to, to relatives, to grandchildren, other people to get them to and from. So we're thankful to be able to allow them to have that money to be able to spend locally here in Marion County. Um, we really haven't, although 45% of our work, of our ridership are going to and from work every day, we really haven't pushed out the uh, workforce transportation here in Marion County which is something we really have to do. We've got a lot of push. We're working closely with economic development. And uh, we know that moving forward, we will need to be able to begin those services. <laughs> and we'll, we'll touch on some of that in, in a little bit. But, um, you know, one thing that we, we just got really focused on is, you know, this growth that we've seen. Um, there's part of our presentation today. We'll talk about a few different potential options as, as we move forward. Um, but we're we're covering six counties and um, we're having having similar conversations in every county and uh, all of it has been positive so far from what we'll share today. But, you know, all in all, just the services are going extremely well here in Mar Marion County. And um, we, we know there's a lot of opportunity for additional services, especially on the workforce side of things. The essential services we're doing pretty good, pretty good with now as far as making sure folks have access. But there's still, like I said, a lot of room to grow. So with that being said, I'm going to welcome Mr. Will up, and then we'll kind of share the presentation. You go to call yes, sir. Oh, Sabrina, do it for you. Uh, you. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I shared this presentation uh, probably a month and a half. Other way around. Oh, no, no, no. You oh, oh, okay. Okay. Um, I shared this presentation about a month and a half ago with Ms. Chavis and some other county officials from different areas. Um, and so this will be, I'll kind of go through this quickly, um, not as much in depth throughout this presentation. But you go ahead, that first one. He touched on our service area and what PDRTA does. We cover six counties in the state of South Carolina, ranging from Chesterfield down to uh, Florence, and we also have outside services that service uh, areas of Williamsburg County, and then, like you mentioned, our bus routes that go all the way to Myrtle Beach and Orion County. So we're the third largest RTA in the country, um, and if you encompass what our what all our routes touch on, we're really probably in second with everywhere we go. It's around 3,600 square miles of service area, um, and that main line is kind of the key to where we're at and what we're seeing as PDRTA is that this is one of the poorest regions of one of the poorest states in the country. So we service a lot of low income poverty level people, as well as people riding out of convenience. So when we talk about some of that community vulnerability and these stats are pulled from the Department of Transportation's uh, CGIS program. It's a, a GSI program where they program in all the health factors, social vulnerability factors of counties um, and all things. But right now we're focused on three main areas, uh, workforce, education, and healthcare. We see that for us as an organization as it ties into our mission and vision segments, but also for public transportation across South Carolina. Uh, what Don also won't mention is he's the president of the Transportation Association of South Carolina. So we also play a hand at moving some of those state initiatives as well. Um, when you look at what we're trying to do is promote these factors over here in bold of economic development, employment opportunities, healthcare accessibility, and affordable housing. Um, in South Carolina right now with the economy, Sorry, I don't have any water. Uh, in South Carolina, the economy right now, you're seeing high unemployment rates, averaging around 3%. Um, and I'll touch on that on a later slide. But at the, at the country's national average right now is also at 3%. But in the PD region, the average is more closer to 45 to 5%. 
Um, and that's the average of all the counties in the PD region. Go ahead and go to the next one. So that's where it comes to workforce necessity. We're talking about industry needs and what does it take to, to change that unemployment rate? Thank you. Take a sip real quick. The industry needs and what does it take to change the unemployment rate in South Carolina? It's attracting new industry. It's attracting new economic growth. And what are the things they're looking for? What are the things that site selectors are looking for? That is the labor and the accessibility. Those are the number two reasons when they're coming into an area, they're looking at a 60 mile span of where to put a site versus whether they put it at Myrtle Beach, Florence, Columbia, they're looking for the accessibility to major markets, the ports, Inland Port Dillon, the ports of Charleston, Wilmington, Georgetown. And they're looking for railroad access, the rail lines. They're looking for interstate access, I-20, I-95 corridors. So those are the things they're looking for on an infrastructure level. When they're looking at the labor needs, they're looking for what is the specialization of workforce? What is the educational system like in the area? Are they going to have workers, a pipeline for workers to come in for the future when they put their plan in? They're looking to make more than just uh, a simple investment as far as their business. They have to be able to get a valuable return over a span of 25, 30 years out of that investment. So these are all factors they're looking at. And when we talk about the infrastructure, public transportation is a key for that. The number one reason for turnover rates in any industry is transportation related needs. Workers aren't getting, aren't able to afford the cars. Um, a lot of one car households where you have two people working and only one of them can take the car and the other one has to find another way. A lot of group rides, a lot of people picking friends up to go to work and so forth. So what happens when one of those people are sick and then you have about five employees out of work? That's where public transportation comes in. You have to have public transportation in the areas to provide that workforce access to allow the industries to come. So when we talk about what PDRTA has done over the past few years with workforce transportation, around 45% of our ridership is strictly workforce related, people going to and from work. And right now we partner with industries such as Harbor Freight, Ruiz Performing Foods and Florence. Um, we're in talk with a few other potential industries right now. Um, and so when we look at those, Harbor Freight, we're doing around 25,000 trips a year. Approximately 25,000 trips per year. And their turnover rate since we started the service has dropped significantly. Their quote, not mine, is that it went from 250% down to 63. But that comes from not just the public transportation being in place. That's because when they're able to have the turnover rate increase, decrease, they can pay more. They're, they're, the turnover one employee at Harbor Freight is roughly five grand. That's to hire someone fire them and rehire someone else cost them five grand per person. So when they drop that turnover rate, they're able to invest that money into higher wages, pay more per hour. And that allows for people to stay on. That allows for them, the community to grow from that, from the employment standpoint. Well, we've done about 40,000 trips at 327 business. Think about it out, out there where Bucky's is, where you have several industry. We've done about 40,000 trips. That's so 40,000, he just said, at, at the industrial park over in Florence, but across from Bucky's in the past six months. So we're, we're huge on workforce transportation, and that's kind of the push from the state level is everything's focused around workforce transportation and getting those people to and from work. Uh, right now, these are current unemployment rates in the area down at the bottom, uh, but we're, we're looking to see those decrease. And of course, the state average right now is about 3.2%. Uh, and so when we talk about some more with the options for workforce transportation, it's not just fixed ride 
planning with a bus and picking people up. You've also got demand and response where we'll take transit vans and go out and pick people up from their home and take them to work. You've got van pool programs that we're starting this year where we'll actually turn over the keys to an employee and he's in charge of picking up the coworkers and taking them back and forth to work. So there's a couple different options we're looking at in workforce transportation and expanding upon that. I think that's the next one. Next part will be the healthcare accessibility. Obviously, y'all had touched upon uh, caring for our senior citizens. An important statistic you might not know is that by 2026, one third of South Carolina's residents will be senior citizens. That is from the Department of Council on Aging at the state level. So we have to understand that, yes, South Carolina's population is growing, but there's also a huge aging population. And how do we help cater to them? How do we provide the health care accessibility for them to be able to get back and forth to the doctor, for them to get mammograms, to get different um, cancer screenings and different specializations um, that may not be in the local area. They may have to go to the VA hospital in Columbia. They may need to go to the beach. They may need to go to North Carolina. So we have to be able to be in a position to cater to that. Um, so we offer a lot of demand and response, a lot of picking people up, taking them different places as far as uh, McLeod, uh, MUSC, um, all of the FQHCs in the area, we partner with about 16 of them. And so that's one of the big pushes for us. Uh, so when you look at these statistics, uh, as far as females, we know there's a huge uh, cervical cancer um, problem in the PD region, um, a lot of breast cancer problem in the PD region. So it's important that we include females in that conversation of how do we cater to the, those needs for the females there, as well as when we look at the poverty status, a lot of people can't afford uh, health care at this day and age. And so that's one of the things we also have to be able to do. And we partner with organizations like Mercy Medicine to be able to provide that access. And he touched upon the Marion County Healthcare Foundation um, and how they've been a huge grantor of ours to provide free services here in Marion County, as well as that uh, continued service to the beach for Marion County residents. And so they've been a huge healthcare partner for us, as well as Trinity Behavioral Care. They're a newer partner for us, and we also partner with them to help with the mental health side of um, healthcare situations. And they service three of the counties in our area. So we work with them pretty closely to see about um, getting people back and forth to get mental health screenings and different things in the behavioral health side. And most passionate to me is the educational opportunities. We'll go ahead and click on to the next one. And what PDRTA has been able to accomplish and is looking to accomplish even further here in Marion County. Uh, so we're talking about health education and workforce, workforce needs. Education is one of the key parts of that. Right now, everyone is looking at manufacturing in the state. They're wanting to attract these industries, but a lot of it is automated. And so a lot of students now are needing to learn how to work mechatronics. They're leading to work, learn how to be engineering um, forward. And a lot of that is at the technical school level. So we need to be partnering with our technical schools to provide those educational opportunities to educate a growing workforce, to be able to attract those industries and be ready to go when they get here. One of the ways we do that is we have a partnership with Darlington County School District right now in their key to career program, which where we'll go pick up students from the high school and take them to an internship, whether with uh, industry such as Sunoco, uh, whether it's local government, whether it's the fire department, police department, um, the banks, different areas. And that allows them to get out of the classroom, get some of that hands-on experience, and then we'll take them back to the school to go home in the afternoon. 
And we're seeing great success with that program. There's a 65% retention rate right now where those seniors, when they graduate, they're getting a job offer from that industry and they're accepting that job offer. So 65% of them are doing that. Uh, we've partnered as well with the school district, South Carolina, Darlington County School District to provide some bus shelters in Hartsville, South Carolina. We've got in the works right now 12 to be going up, and those are coordinated with the school district as far as heat mapping, where the students are needing to get picked up by the yellow bus. We're coordinating it for our bus uh, bus shelters to be there for their needs as well. Um, so that allows for USB charging, Wi-Fi capabilities, um, so those kids are able, when there's a power outage or say they're running late on their homework, because I've done that, uh, they can go to that bus shelter early in the morning, be out of the rain, be out, get some shade from the heat in the summer, and do that schoolwork there while they're waiting for their bus. And this has really been important for us um, at, in pushing our community partner level um, and being, being good community partners and working with the school district to provide that. Another thing we do for our uh, Florence adult education is the ESL program, where we work with the ESL teachers there to coordinate the a field trip to show ESL students, which is English second language students, how to use public transit and how to work in everyday society. So they'll take a, a field trip on PDRTA buses, learn how the, the passes and all work and be able to go to places and learn how to open a bank account, learn how to shop at different stores. Um, so this has been a huge, huge program for us that we're looking to continue. And so this is just a brief, some of the things, I'll actually talk about this picture. We actually did a, a asthma camp with one of the programs over in Florence where we take asthma students out and allow them to do some different things through the a camp they were able to be a part of there. Uh, but what reliable transportation ends up doing is it opens doors. It opens doors for our young learners. It allows them to get out of the house, get off of their phones. They can go to a library if they need to go study or order a book. They can go, uh, pretty much anywhere that within the area that our public transportation allows. And this, and this has shown across the state, across the nation, to increase the attendance rates for schools. This has shown to that test scores end up inevitably going up when their students are not cooped up in a house or either cooped up in a school for seven hours. And this has shown to work as far as the industry level to be able to provide these students with that early education, um, to be able to be productive citizens and productive workers for industries. You can go to the next one, perfect. And then we talk about the effects of investing in transit. Mm -hmm. On one of the earlier slides, it shows that you get a four to one economic return. So for every dollar that is invested in public transportation, $4 is located back into the economic uh, vitality of that community. So that's kind of where this topic is stemming from. There's, there's two, main source funds of transport for two main source funds for funding public transit at the state level. One of them is uh, a transportation tax is a 25 year tax. And that's not one I want to talk about today. One I want to talk about today is use fees and voter, uh, not voter uh, vehicle registration fees through the use of road use fees. So when we go through what's possible with dedicated funding, all of those things that we talked about with those three areas of healthcare transportation, healthcare accessibility, workforce transportation, and educational opportunity, it comes from this plan here that we're looking to expand upon. Building our intercounty workforce routes to allow people that are working outside of Marion County to not spend their money outside of it, but to bring that money back in. Um, you're talking about intermodal centers to allow different 
modes of transportation to meet up in an area, um, improve senior and accessibility and ADA accessibility and veteran access, um, increase frequencies. One of the biggest needs we get from riders is they want to see us run faster, 30 minute headways instead of an hour and weekend service. Um, everyone wants to get somewhere on Saturday or church on Sunday. Um, and when we talk about the bus shops and bus, bus stops and bus shelters, that comes from the improved infrastructure in place. And that's a part of being able to revitalize downtown areas. Um, one of the ways we do that is where anywhere our bus shelter can hit, we can be in conversation to talk about redoing sidewalks. We can be um, in conversation for any of those DOT infrastructure enhancements. Uh, as well as those internship programs. I understand Marion County is working on one now in the school district, and I'm trying to be a part of that as well. We're working on that right now, uh, as well as the technical schools, uh, building out that base from Florence Darlington Tech uh, and allowing them to come over here and the students to be able to reach that secondary education that they're gonna need for a one to two year program to be able to work in these new industries. And we have one other piece that I'm working on uh, the city of Florence later today on is um, the bike and pedestrian access. We have bike racks on every bus we deploy in Marion County. And we do have quite a few bike riders that will actually bike to a stop, put the bike on the front of the bike rack and take off. So one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that PDRTA is a great recipient of P307 funds. We also receive P311 funds, but we are able to use 90% federal money for bike and pedestrian projects. So there's an area where it makes sense to have a, a bike lane a, along a transit corridor or a bus shelter. We can get 90% federal funding to be able to do that type of project. So a dollar for 10. And this is the vehicle use fees for road use fees, not vehicle use fees, but the road use fees, um, this is the primary way that a RTA is supposed to be funded per state law. Right now, the main way we're funded, funded is through local partnerships and um, those working with the county, working with the municipalities and coming out to these council meetings and being able to you know, scrape and beg for every dollar we can once a year. Um, and right now we have to do that with about 38 municipalities and local governments. Um, and so this is going to be a more dedicated source funding for us. This is going to be able to expand those services even more than what we're able to do now. Um, and this sets us up for that growth of the future um, because we know a lot is coming in the PD, PD region and we want to be there to be able to support it when it does come. Seven of the um, there's seven RTAs in the state of South Carolina. PDRTA, obviously, we have the largest geographical region. Uh, five of the seven currently have either the transportation tax or tax or the road use fees in place. And there's conversations on that six. And you know, we, we don't want to be the last one in the state to be able to try to pull this off. And so, with five of the seven currently having um, either the transportation, which is a 25 year. We know that's a tough sell, you know, through our six rural counties we serve, but our other option and what a lot of rural communities do is based on that vehicle registration fee. So we hope we'll be able to pull this off in, in all six counties that we serve. So that's, these would be the estimated figures. This is what we pulled from um, the tax assessor as far as what's being renewed annually. Uh, so this is just a rough estimate of what that that would look like in the figures of between 750 to 1250, but obviously that price is at your discretion. Um, and then this is kind of just a comparison to what it would look like daily expenses. To give you an idea, our current budget in Marion County is about $1.2 million a year. That's, that's with our the Myrtle Beach services that we're running, our Marion Express, Mullins Express, our demand response. And depending on kind of what we're facing, uh, 1.2 to 1.4 is what we're projecting for 24, 25. Being able to implement a project like this, this you know, let's just say that the middle of the road there, um, let's just say it's $10. What that $250,000 would do 
would actually increase our annual budget by $1 million. So you're almost doubling the budget that we're currently operating by being able to put in a $10 uh, per vehicle registration fee. And this is important to note that this is providing for the local match of all of our uh, state and federal funding. So those number, those comparisons he offered earlier about being able to get 80% funding, 90% funding, this would apply in that in that funding aspect as well. We currently employ um, 12 employees from Marion County. This would put, probably put us over, over the 20 mark for what we'd have, have to be able to, to, to run operations. And this is the specific code for that um, out of the code of laws for South Carolina. I don't think we mentioned this, but this is PDRCA's 50th year. It's been around since 1974. So we've got a couple big uh, celebrations later this year. And uh, this would be uh, some icing on the cake to help us celebrate our 50th to be able to finally move in a direction where we have sustainability. Um, you know, our local communities, um, Mayor Mullins, the county, the funds that were currently generated through the general fund would no longer be necessary with this type of thing. So those funds could be allocated toward other resources. And we just wanted to end with this because, you know, there's nothing on here that, that's not not really reach you know, we can reach all of this with um with those conversations depending on kind of the dollar amount where it lands at to determine just how much of this we're able to uh, or at what level we're able to pull some of this off but there's a lot of opportunity um for us to be able to just really expand existing services to be able to provide more reliable services we do surveys on board i think we'll maybe mix that twice a year and the one, the couple of things we always get is the the weekends, the extended hours. We have a lot of workforce now that's they're doing more of a second shift job. So we we're able to get them to work, but currently they're having to find other ways to get home. Some of that maybe walking five or six miles, you know, after dark. So this allows us to be able to run later later hours and provide more services. There's no doubt that you know the I know we mentioned thirty five hundred to four thousand trips a month. Being able to do something like this is going to truly expand that number. We're we're, we're probably from closer to forty to fifty thousand trips um, a year. We'd be closer to a hundred thousand here in Miami. Anything else? That's it for me. You got anything? Anything? That's it. So well, certainly, questions. Open any questions, and thank y'all. I know it's been a, a, another lengthy presentation. Mm -hmm. so, answer any questions you may have everybody got a question i do um so your route's going to middle beach how many of them go through 378 highway 378 so the the, the service we're running from marion county we're, we're, we have five stops we actually go up through um up through uh centenary we, we go through aner we turn on 22 that particular route starts on the North Myrtle Beach, North Myrtle Beach end, dropping on, dropping off at the coast along the resorts, and it heads south. We have another service that connects Lake City and Johnsonville, South Carolina. Similar service, but we're from that one. It's Lake City 341 to Johnsonville, 378 in the Conway, and then we go all the way up to Myrtle Beach. We go down to 27th Avenue South, and then that bus heads north, dropping off at the resorts. So that bus that's leaving Johnsonville that's going to Conway. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if that bus can stop at the hot spot on 378 um, in the Gresham community. We do. You do. We pick up passengers every day, even though that's our lower Florence County bus. Mm -hmm. We have passengers board every day right there at the hot spot. And then the what used to be called the parking below the area. Yeah, we have folks boarding there pretty much every day. When, when do you bus? Is there a certain time for that? Yes, sir. So we uh, the bus leaves Lake City at six thirty. We're in Johnsonville about fifty after, so seven ten, seven fifteen. We're picking up right there on three seventy eight. Okay, and I talked to our administrator about this um, before. Uh, we had a lot of people when I was a kid, um, only because we had a lot of older people who worked down at Myrtle Beach and used to ride with them and get jobs at the Pavilion and Family Kingdom. Um, I'm interested in getting these young people some summer jobs down in Myrtle Beach uh, to keep them busy. Uh, and, and how could PDRT assist with that? If 
So we're not limited by any means by what we're currently doing. This is a program that we started with Darlington County School District. It, it just started because three or four different people got together and said, this is a great need for us. Um, the, the lady that kind of runs that program was taking children in her personal vehicle, which is a major liability issue. Mm -hmm. We have insurance for that purpose. So, you know, there's certainly options. I mean, you know, being able to, to kind of work through this program, we would be able to deploy different assets. So not everyone needs to be there, at, you know, leaving here at 630 in the morning. You may have other needs could be a, a 9 or 10 a.m. start time. So they, it would open up the door to be able to look at options like that to get those children or, or kids down there to to the beach to work. And again, going back to Centenary, you said the bus goes from Aina to Centenary. Well, we're going straight straight out 501. Okay. Um, um, uh, Arrows Crossroads, right there, is where we're, we're picking up also. Then it goes into Ainer. Um, so it's not, we're not doing anything with the beach bus down. I, I misspoke when I said Centenary. We're not doing anything down like Britain's and that correction. That's all demand response service. So we're picking those folks up from home and taking them to their destinations. And they could, could they ask for a rise to work? Or that just Today they services. couldn't because that that service demand response service is not starting early enough to connect them. That is a possibility um, in the future to be able to have a connection that would get them over to five hundred one where they could board at one of our one of the main stops. What time does the demand response service start? Uh, we run that kind of in conjunction with the Mullins and Marion Express. So between eight eight thirty in the morning, we're starting to pick up uh, passengers. Um, so I understand he said that you're president of the Transportation Association. Yes. And so looking at these issues, when you're talking about workforce development and skilled labor, wh what are you all looking for in future employees? What do you see the, the employees around the state? And not only just uh, skills, but just basic abilities. For instance, uh, a lot of school districts don't teach kids how to write with their hands, hand writing. And so some kids are not even becoming proficient typing. So is this something that you would think is a basic skill that kids need to have for these industries that you want to attract? Yeah, certainly. And, and Will wants to speak to this, but I do want to mention one thing before, before he does that. So, um, through my, my role with TASC, um, I'm also on the um, Department of Employment Workforce at the state level coordinating council. And they've been meeting, um, uh, they meet pretty pretty regular once a month and they have a quarterly meeting as well. But um, they have a major focus, Act 67 that was passed um, this past year. The, the the main focus that they're looking at from workforce, commerce, whoever you talk, whoever you speak to, they have two main objectives. One is workforce <coughs> access, accessibility, which we'll touch on earlier, and the other um, is actually child care. They, what they see is that there's a lot of opportunity for in the child care to where you can get certain folks back into the workforce that, that right now, because it's just not an affordable option, they're, having, they're taking care of one, two, three, four kids, and there's someone that could be a dedicated employee, but because there's just it's, it's too, too much to be able to afford child care, um, they're not taking on those, those jobs. But we won't speak to the other piece, but we, you know, obviously um, the technical side of things, technical schools is, is becoming more and more for Tech. Uh, we partner with them um, on, on many fronts. Northeastern Tech, you know, that covers Dillon, Marlboro, and Chesterfield County. We're working with them as well. So we're open to having conversations. We've done we've done some summer camps uh, for children to get them to two different uh, programs. It's something we haven't done in Marion County, but something I would love to, to love to explore. Um, just to touch on your, you had asked about what the, what industries are looking for as far as you said, typing. Well, just basic skills, basic things that we can all pick a pencil here and write notes because we've been taught how to write. Yeah. Some school districts aren't teaching kids how to write. You're right. And across the state, you'll see that your average 10th grader is actually reading on a eighth grade level basis. Um, part of that we can thank for the coronavirus pandemic and um, the hindrance it put on keeping students outside of school instead of in school. Um, but as far as from an industry standpoint, a lot of your industries are moving toward automation. Um, the number one 
program to learn right now as far as enrollment numbers and getting jobs is mechatronics. And that's the process of learning the computers behind running those machines and robots, as well as the maintenance of them. So we may be seeing that industry is moving to a more automated stage because it's cheaper for them, but we can, they will always need somebody to work on those, uh, those machines there. So um, I think that's the way to look at it. Um, as far as basic needs, yes, I, I do believe everyone should be able to write and that's something that the school should prioritize at an early level. But um, as far as an industry standpoint, um, you got to think about post high school graduation. Um, what are, what are they going to be looking for to be ready to work? What do you well, let me ask you this question? If you are hiring this individual, should you are you just going to assume that that person is right? In my if I'm hiring someone, yes, you're right. I would be, but we have a written test that you have to take. And if you can't, you can be in trouble. You're going to struggle with it. You know, I've got a freshman too, and um, I had to teach him two years ago how to to sign his name because they, they just got rid of cursive handwriting. Like you just you know, had no no idea how to do that. So I had to teach him how to do that. But, but a lot of that, you know, it certainly should be concerning. And as far as how we how we move forward, well, let me ask one last thing. Let's speak to that. So, and I, I think this. This may not be common knowledge. Sometimes you show up and apply for a job, but then you still have to think the key batteries. Um, and that's something that I think uh, with our former race, I know people who going to apply for some job that they couldn't pass. You take the drugs test to the job. And so, is there something that you know about in the workforce service that's helping to direct some of our citizens towards some assistance in getting some test prep? for these jobs do we think that is a to your question um do we think that's more of a workforce space or should that be involved in the educational space to make sure that the students are graduating and learning the needs that that's going to help them get that job they should already know that in school correct or no true um but i'm interested in because you guys do a great job you said Harvard Freight, Ruiz, Performance Food, Pepsi, got routes taking people to these jobs. I think that's great. Um, and I would be interested to see how many people in Marion County are uh, being able to benefit from this, um, for those jobs. But they have to be able to pass the test to be hired. I will speak to that somewhat. So, part of the Marion County Economic Group, we're, we're part of. Um, they, they meet often as well. One thing I've noticed that recently is your adult education your and your and your district, they've all been present in those meetings. They're actually having conversations with your local industry. So your DMA, your SAPACO, some of the others are actually having conversations about what they're seeing on the industry side of things. And so from what I can tell, they're already working together uh, to some extent to be able to make sure that um, just getting prepared that some of, you know, I know some of that is like I said, adult education, but I think that feeds well into your, you know, your middle and high school. And I've, we've seen it, we, we cover six counties, so we're involved in these kind of conversations. The one thing that, you know, I've been impressed with is in some areas, we have industries that are actually getting involved with seventh and eighth graders early on. And they're, they're bringing them in on tours and showing them these facilities saying, you know, this is where you want to be in four or five years and, and uh, being able to kind of guide them early on, I think is the way, one way to be able to, to get those, those students better prepared for the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I know everything has to do with funding. Okay. When you present this to the state level, uh, what kind of money would you need statewide to make this program uh, at the point it needs to be? So, you know, we, we operate um, like at the RTAs, like we cover states, counties, and there's obviously seven, or seven RTAs, but um, this, this statewide initiative is something we're also working on. We had a reception last week to try to push that initiative. Uh, we haven't been funded uh, as far as the state mass transit funds. Major, vast majority, 7% of what we do is covered by federal funds. 
And then ideally, in, in, the, in a perfect world, 15% of what's left would be covered at the state level and 15% would be covered at the local level to be able to match that 100%. But for years, because of the number of hands reaching into the state pot, we've been funded, pretty much been level funded. So that has been an issue. But um, but this this is this what we're talking about today is really really not <laughs> excuse me um a state statewide issue. It's more of the local. So for instance, your um your your Columbia and your Myrtle Beach and your Charleston and uh, your Sumter RTA and and Low Country, all of them, they're fighting their own battles. But whenever they implement these programs, whether it's a transportation tax or the or the road use fee through the registration fees of vehicles, then they're they're winning those battles. They're able to be able to to ensure sustainability measures. They're able to to add new services, bring on new employees to do even more of what we're what we're doing. Um, roughly right now in our six counties, eighty percent of everyone that steps on our bus, whenever we do surveys, they're saying they don't have access to a vehicle. So, getting those folks to the workplace, getting them to their you know appointments, it, it helps at so many levels. It keeps keeps them out of an ER. It keeps them employed. It keeps that funding coming back. The other piece we didn't really touch on is the, the rural issue. You know, AESC is coming to Florence pretty soon. We know that that's going to pull a lot of um, folks from industries. And it's, it's a big conversation. We're meeting with them this Thursday to have a, have a conversation about this. Uh, we have to make sure we have services in place to be able to either help backfill those positions when they lose them or help someone be able to get to AESC and then come back to Marion County because when they start going to get that, that great job, a great salary, what we don't want for Marion County perspective is them to go get an apartment in Florence because then you, you're losing your tax base. So having that route to that front door and be able to come back here, but also ensuring that we're covering our existing industry that we have here with providing those services. Um, I think all that is key to being able to move forward. So, so you are saying the state's funding at the 15% level? Uh, the state, depending on the project, yes, sir. They, the state's doing more on the capital side of things. So they do more for infrastructure, like to buy new buses. As far as operating, there's not a lot there. We have enough to cover a portion of our um, fuel and a portion of our salaries, but not nearly what it needs to be. The federal portion is there. And we've left federal funding on the table for the past decade for Marion County because we don't have enough local support. Um, we our other counties are funding us right now. The the lowest would be around twenty thousand, up to about a hundred thousand. And right now, Marion County, our I think our local commitment for twenty three twenty four was five thousand dollars. Is that total countywide? No, the entity like Marion Mullen. No, sir, that's just the county. So that's not. Um, it depends on where you're at. But for instance, Dillon County is at forty thousand right now. But then we have quite a few other partners: McLeod Hospital, Care South Carolina. Harbor Freight Tools. We have a, a lot of partners to help you know come to the table to be able to leverage uh, the federal funds we have in place. Yeah, I, I, and let me just make sure I understand. Okay. So in this county, the city of Mullins, city of Marion, what do they have? The city's doing ten thousand dollars. Marion and Mullins, ten thousand dollars each. The county did five thousand dollars. The healthcare foundation's doing about fifty thousand okay. dollars. Good. Yes, sir. Yeah, and the only reason I wanted to mention that. The only entity I know in the state is the state government. And that's got a huge surplus. Yes, sir. Well, all they could do is, and anytime somebody's got extra money, I just always try to ask for extra. I don't yeah. care if it's 15 or 20. And sometimes they're not going to have any extra. Yes, sir. And, they, and there is, and they, like I said, they they do more, it's been more on infrastructure and uh, not as much. Like we just rehabbed the Marin facility. We went in and, and we've got that back open for business. They help fund that kind of project, but as far as the service itself, they they want us to lean more onto the local local. Um, and the reason I say that we've got an outstanding senator and house member who, and especially Mr. Kent Williams. Yes, sir. Uh, we might need to make sure that he works a little harder to get some additional funding. Yeah. So you know we we wanted we want to do more. I mean, this is a public service, you know. So we you know we're here to be able to do what we can. You know, this type of project, you know, it, it allows us to do more. It don't change much as far as administration and day to day. It's just being able to provide more for the folks that need it. And it's it's becoming more of not just those that 
need it, but the better the services are, you're going to have choice riders. You're going to have folks that they may have options, but now they're going to get on a bus because it's uh, it's just convenient for them. And with car prices the way they are right now, it's oh. it's, it's needed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Senator Rickenbach shared that this past Tuesday. He said the the average new car now is fifty one thousand dollars, and the average used car is thirty two thousand. So it, if it's it's tough to be able to go out there, and and you, not only that, your average interest rate is probably nine to eleven percent. Yeah, that's the worst part. So it is. Of taxes and insurance. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, that's that's right. Thank you all for coming. It's been very informative. Thank you, Council. We will get together with our administrator and discuss any possibilities. Thank you all so much. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. All right, item 11, administrative update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of Council, those of you in attendance. I just have some brief updates. Um, <clears throat> Our animal shelter, um, the facility, the electricity is done. Um, plumbing is about 75% done. They should be finished uh, within the next week and a half. We're also putting a fence around the um, pond. So that should be going up next week. We were supposed to have that um, up, but he did get sick. So we had to push that back a week. We also, excuse me. We'll be having a sheltering 101, um, which is an informative public meeting about what's going on at the shelter. Um, we'll be discussing topics such as fosters um, and volunteers, our managed intake um, process, adoption and rescue, as well as um, laws um, relating to animals. So that particular meeting will be on Thursday, March 21st at 6 p.m. from 6 to 7 p.m. We're going to have it here in the county chamber. So you all are welcome. Uh, we'll have the flyers out on our website and we um, encourage you all to come if you have questions. Um, just a reminder that the clerk of court um, office will be moving to the old administration building starting March 18th. So again, if you have child support payments, um, anything related to clerk of court, that office will be moving to the old administration building, which um, is across from the food lion on Main Street. Finally, um, we are working, Sabrina and I are working on digitizing our county ordinances on our new website that we will be having. So we'll be working through that process, um, digitizing our ordinances for the public to be able to read those at their convenience. That is all the updates I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, requests and comments from council members. I have a couple of comments. This past weekend, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, the city of Marion had their 10 new girls participate in the state. They, they won the district, which is unusual for the small communities because they, they don't have a classification anymore. They uh, lost two games, but one was in overtime, the other one, I think, was like two points. So they represented uh, our county very well. And at the same weekend, we had the opportunity to play in the state and Westminster. We ended up receiving the runner-up awards. The team that beat us had uh, City of Clemson, Central, and people playing all the way from uh, Liberty, which is probably a, a classification that they shouldn't have been in. They should have been in the big one where you play Florence, Greenville County, and uh, we won the first game by nine, and uh, the second game in double overtime got beat. So, we represented the county very well also the city month. Congratulations. Got the eight and under boys, even though we had a girl play. <laughs> Anything else? I have one. Um, I have uh, two appointments for my boards. Uh, Ms. Rynell Goss, Economic Development. Ms. Felicia Burns, the Planning and Zoning. And um, I see our Road and Bridge supervisors here. Mr. Dahl Black, I would like to commend them and their team on the roles and the work that's been doing around the county. Um, they've been doing a tremendous job, and I'd just like to commend them with that. And uh, that's it to me. All right, we need an executive session.
with personnel yes. and contracts? Yes, sir. So moved. Second. Second. Motion second. Discussion. All in favor, motion to signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, likewise. The ayes have it. We went in executive session for an industrial contractual matter. No action was taken. We need to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, the motion to signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, likewise. The ayes have it. Uh, we went in executive session for a contractual and personnel issue. No action was taken. What I hear from the county. So, so we're adjourned. Second.